40. 39. Number one. 39. 38. 37. 36. 35. 34. 33 one. Hey, Rocky, you want to see me pull a show out of my hat? Nothing up my sleeve. Let's go. Good evening and welcome to the Mouthwash Talk Show, a minty fresh take on politics. And hey, our countdown to the primary, it, it is on full speed. We have several, several uh, Republican challengers in this state that are that their their day of doom is going to be on May 7th. And and in a lot of these cases, if they win their primary, they're in. All they got to do is breathe until November and they are going to be winners. So uh, we have uh, quite a few people coming up here tonight. We have John Kenworthy, and I. This is gonna be new to me, like it is to you. Uh, he was just talking backstage about being on WoWo, the radio station WoWo, and I know a few Central Indiana people probably never heard of WoWo, but it's a Fort Wayne-based uh, radio station, and it's pretty cool. I I remember listening to it a few times. He did an interview on there. I told him, now you're at the big time. Now you're big time. Uh, you're coming on the mouthwash show, uh, so you better be ready. But hey, I. It's going to be an all guys show because tonight, Lucy, she's making a prom dress because, you know, she's a, a homesteader. She's making a prom dress for her daughter for, you know, for the prom. So she's got to do this sewing tonight. And she said she might pop on for conspiracy theory because, you know, she I mean, conspiracy fact, because, you know, she can't miss that. And then Tiffany is traveling in Orlando. So it's just going to be me and Brad holding down the fort here. But I know Brad, he's got plenty of questions and. You know, I can throw a couple of them in there too. But hey, we got some pretty big news. We got some big news. Next week, next week we do have uh, installment number four of Burning the Bridges in Madison County. It's going to be a round robin of folks running for office in Mad Madison County. I think we're up to three or four, or maybe five. Whatever it is, we're going to split up the time. We're going to have them on. We're going to talk about Madison County. I just love it. It's just so good. Uh, so we got that coming up. And then uh, on the 30th, on the 30th, I just got word from John Jacob. Uh, he's going to split the time with Mark Hurt. So John Jacobs running for U.S. House District 6, and Mark Hurt is running for U.S. House District 3. So we'll figure out some something there, because they're not running against each other, so it might be a good conversation. They'll either split the time, maybe have them on both at the same time. I don't know. We'll make up something to make it interesting and fun, so you can find out about those candidates. Uh, and then we have the election on May 7th. And then after that, we have Becky Cash coming on. We're actually going to talk about the Indiana legislature. Uh, and uh, we're going to see what she did last session and then look forward to that future. But hey, the big news, the big news is we have a little special show coming up. It's going to be on Friday, April 26 at 730. And we're going to have Jamie Rittenauer come on. And this is, uh, it's not the mouthwash talk show, but Chateau de Mars Hill is the producer of it. Uh, she has requested that we do a three podcaster, actually Watson's a, uh, international broadcaster or broadcaster and professional or something different than just a podcaster. Uh, and then we have Josh Cummins from uh, Faith, Faith, Family and Politics. So it's going to be three podcasters having a Q&A with Jamie Rittenauer, and that's going to be fun to watch. So you want to catch it. Uh, we're gonna, it's going to be going out to all these little podcasts, so you, you should be able to catch that. So... I'm going to go play. I just fresh off the presses, just got this done today. Uh, so I'm pretty proud of myself. This is a pretty good promo here for this thing. So we want you to tune in for this show. But here is the commercial. And hey, guess what? On the other side, we got John Kenworthy back here. And uh, I hope I don't mess up and call him John Trustworthy, but I don't think he'd mind that. So anyway, here's your preview for the Jamie Rittenauer special show, April 26th at 7.30 p.m.
and there you have it. So, hey, John Kenworthy, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing wonderful. It's been a, a very busy day, uh, like, like you alluded to, but uh, excited to be on here and and uh, maybe get a, a little bit different questions than I normally get up in this part of the state. That's a pretty cool microphone you got there. That's uh, that's fancy. Uh, you you don't look very technology, technic, whatever. You don't look like that. You're savvy enough to have a cool microphone like that. I my hats off. It sort of matches your beard too. That's just very very good. That that should give uh, our viewers a, a preview of how you'll run things efficiently, and they're gonna look. It's gonna not only function but look good. So, John, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself. Sure. So I grew up in the third district uh, up in Fort Wayne, uh, came from a, a humble background. Uh, my parents were blue collar workers in the trucking industry, uh, graduated from Concordia Lutheran High School up here. And, and shortly after graduating, I enlisted in the army. It, it was just a little bit after 9-11. And uh, I had always heard stories from my grandfathers that served during World War II and, and felt that I was being called to serve as well. So I uh, enlisted in 2003 uh, and chose combat arms. I went down to Fort Knox, Kentucky and trained to be a cavalry scout. Uh, and then a couple months later, at just 19, I found myself in Iraq. I ended up doing two deployments to Iraq. Uh, the second one, I was one of the guys that was there for the troop surge. So they extended my contract involuntarily. Uh, <laughs> they in asked a, you to a stay. Huh? Called, called stop loss, uh, also <laughs> sort of colloquially known as uh, backdoor draft. Um, but uh, I went back and, and did my time. And unfortunately, uh, that deployment uh, combined with the other one, my unit lost over 30 men. Uh, the Army Times even did an article about us being the hardest hit since Vietnam. And it, it really took a toll on me. And it's the biggest reason why I wanted to get involved in politics. So I came home uh, in 2008 and started going to then IPFW, now Purdue Fort Wayne, and studied political science because I wanted to learn more about the how and why of the war that I was a part of and see what I could do to maybe help our military and help our veterans. Uh, at that time, though, it was 2008, which is a terrible time to quit your job, uh, <laughs> right during the recession, and then uh, was, was working still in the reserve, but also working uh, full time and going to school and had a young family. I had actually brought my wife. I stole her from Germany and, and brought her over here because I was stationed there and uh, went through the legal immigration process. I sponsored her green card. Um, but uh, during that time frame, you know, we, we lost our health insurance because of Obamacare, then uh, had my hours cut because of o Obamacare and had a young family and, and really what, what started is wanting to do something for our military and, and veterans grew to more than that because I was really disturbed about the path that our country was going down. Um, since then, I spent two years working for Senator Coates. That was my first political job. Uh, and I learned a lot from him. And uh, I, I was there as an unpaid intern to start, which was a, a big risk having a house back here and paying for an apartment out in DC for something that wasn't guaranteed to be a job. But thankfully, uh, him and his team hired me on after just a month, uh, mainly because I wasn't your standard intern at that point, uh, had a little bit more life experience than, than most people they see. Uh, and then for the last four years, I've worked for Senator Braun and I was his military legislative assistant. So I was his senior policy advisor on defense policy, veterans affairs, foreign affairs, uh, things like DHS and the State Department, um, and also a couple other smaller areas uh, just to cover down. So NASA and, and, and tribal affairs. Well, I think you pretty much answered the why because you've had experience in all of those things. And the reason I got into politics is because I was having such a hard time with the city and permitting and trying to do something good in a in a uh, underserved neighborhood and was just treated like dirt. And it, and, and it, you know, you can complain, but put, you know, put a little skin in the game. So, you know, I, I've already got a bunch of questions here and I, I want to save them, but, you know, you've actually experienced the system. <laughs> and I think when somebody experiences a system, uh, you know, just one of them, just one of what you mentioned is enough to make you, your head spin, but you're never the same. <laughs> yeah. You're never, you can't unsee it. Uh, and so, you know, the fact that you've worked for these folks, you know, and I didn't, honestly, I didn't do any research on you. I've been, I, I apologize. I've just been so 
it's been just crazy busy. Uh, but we do have uh, Mark Smalltalk, who did some research on you. Now, I have not listened to Smalltalk, but I did notice we got hey, we got a surprise for you. Tiffany, Tiffany is taking a break from her luxurious Orlando, uh, you know, trip down there, you know, just in the sun and everything. She probably had to break herself away from the beach and the tiki's and the little umbrella drinks and all that. But it's good that she's able to make it. I think she felt bad just leaving me and Brad here watching the. And really, she's probably thinking they'll get screwed up if you just leave me and Brad in charge. So she's got to keep her eye on us. But I'm going to go ahead and we're going to play. Uh, we're going to play uh, small talk, and we'll see what Mark has to say about you. Now, one thing, John, I don't know if you've ever seen small talk, but Mark claims to be the left leaning part of the Republican Party. But don't call him a liberal. You call him a liberal, and then fighting words. <laughs> so, uh, but so he's always got some interesting takes. Oh, and now Lucy's popped up in here. What is this? These people, they really don't trust me and Brad. So yeah, Tiffany's back there cheering, leading the cheering section. So here you go. No, no more, no more surprises. Uh, but here you go. Mark Small, this might be a surprise. Hi, I'm Mark Small. This is Small Talk. John Kenworthy is running for U.S. House of Representatives in the 3rd Congressional District. He's John's guest. And I was reading his stand on issues. And there were some things in there I found interesting. One, he talked about our military and how we shouldn't be in forever wars. And people got not sliced and diced. He didn't use those words. I would. And at the same time as he was talking about how we have to address these deficits in our budget. I want to do small talk, and as usual, you guys can go ahead and talk about whatever the hell you want after I get off of here. But realize that we have a huge deficit run up by Trump. None of that broad economy that's great. We also have a huge deficit because of military spending. Our military makes us less secure. We get attacked after we do bombing campaigns on countries. We have an immigration crisis because people are coming up from South America from countries, governments of which were freely elected decades ago, we put in dictators that were more friendly to our choices of corporations that are now owned by a whole bunch of people from other countries. My point is this, if you wanna make us more secure and have a military preparedness, let's cut the budget for the military. It might sound like it doesn't make sense. It does. We spend as much as the next 20 countries to us in military, and that makes no sense. Because when we go out and bomb people, we get less secure. Iraq, they had nothing to do with 9-11. So we have this period after 9-11 where the rest of the world felt sorry for us. So what did the corporations do while George W. was in office? Hey, let's get Iraq. We can get all that oil. We cut the military budget. We actually improve our security. And we have deficits because of things that we don't need, like tax cuts for the very rich or our military. Mark Small, Small Talk, peace. Oh, well, he's actually got a, uh, I got a question for you there. I, I, you know, that generally Mark will talk about something I'm totally related and he has done his little research on you, unlike me, unlike me, but yeah, Tiffany, thanks for coming on. I, you know, I, this is a surprise. I didn't think you're going to make it. And we have Lucy audio only because you can't be on online and sew at the same time, apparently. So walking and chewing gum is the things. So, he doesn't uh, want to show off the dress yet. You know? Yeah, that's right. Well, Lucy, if you do get it done, uh, please show us uh, at Conspiracy Theory if you get done by that time period. So so we'll start with Tiffany. Tiffany, how are you doing tonight down there? You know, vacation in the Caribbean or wherever the heck you are? You're muted. Uh, Tiffany, you're muted. So this is your first time on the show? <laughs> no, I'm in Orlando for a, a work conference uh, here with about uh, 1,600 realtors and... Uh, and I did take some time away just to be on the show because I missed you guys last week. And I, I wanted to see everybody's face. Is my cousin Cynthia Snyder there? Do you know her? I don't know her, but it's I'm Cynthia I'm sure Yosha she's Snyder. Here. She's a talk to Tucker person up on the north side. So I don't hey. know. It was just yeah, Tiffany. I thought you were just Bigfoot hunting. <laughs> yeah, really. It's hard to find a Bigfoot print in the sand, isn't it? <laughs> you know, there um it's it's like a bird feeder. You just always have to have some bait out there. <laughs> oh, well, so speaking of bait, the squ yeah. my squirrel trap, you'll never guess what I caught. I caught a squirrel today in the trap. So I'm up to 13 squirrels I've caught in my yard. John, I I've, I've got this uh, squirrel relocation program going. I caught our cat. I caught our cat for the second time tonight. 
<laughs> I was like, that poor little cat. He's a feral cat, but he was not happy. So anyway, but yeah, I relocated that one to uh, Thompson Road. <laughs> So it's all good. We're, we're what doing do you that. do with the squirrels? You relocate them? I relocate them. them. Yeah, they're all over. I take them up to guys. I take them on a little drive. I, you know, go like this so they can't figure out how to get back home. But I've caught no, 13. No. Build, what? Build a catapult. Like build oh, a my catapult gosh. You're, and just launch you, them. you're supposed to be a Democrat with a heart. That sounds like some of <laughs> the Republican would say. Well, they shoot them over the wall that we built. Slingshot. The Mexico people let them go. Yeah, they let them go. You guys are, see, this is what you're in, for, in, in store for, John. So, Brad, how are you doing now that you have to share the spotlight with, with Tiffany? Now she crashed her party. And I, know, yeah, I had, uh, well, I had some questions, but uh, no, I did want to go uh, and talk about small talk stuff. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Well, let's get started. I, I, well, because I grew up, I was in college when 9 11 happened. And so, like I, I, you know, I understand John when you, you know, felt like a, a drawing to, to to enlist. So, um, and and I think Mark kind of kind of glosses over, you know, what that time was like and like what decisions were made then. And I know that we gave up a lot, and it's probably going to take, you know, a lot to get some liberties back or some rights back and some of our own privacy back. Um, but I, I don't know that. It, it, it's so black and white uh, as, as he painted it. Was there a question there, Lucy? <laughs> oh, no, I was just, you know. <laughs> okay, we're not oh, to the question part. With Mark, well, it's always, it, it, you know, it wasn't as doom and gloom. So that was, that was kind of nice, you know. It was yeah. more like a question and not, hey, we're all just spiraling down this path towards non-existence. Um, yeah, and, and and you know, I'm I'm happy to respond to to what he said, um, because I, I think he he brought up a lot of very good and va very valid points, uh, and it's something that I've been talking about a lot because uh, you know the the top three issues for me are you know the border and immigration, and then our debt and rebuilding our military and taking care of our veterans, and the debt and the military that they are very intertwined. And that's why I'm going to be requesting to go on either the Armed Services Committee or the Appropriations Committee, uh, Armed Services Subcommittee uh, for Appropriations. Because, you know, if, if I go to Washington, I can't count on states like California and Maryland and New York to vote in a conservative way to get one of these big wins like we would like to see, uh, such as a balanced budget amendment or, or something like that. So short of that, what do you do as, as a single member of Congress? Well, you, you need to look for the low hanging fruit and you need to, to take advantage of places where we might be able to make some changes uh, that aren't the third rail, that aren't the social securities, the Medicare's, things like that. And that place is the military because it is approximately 60% of our discretionary spending. And there's a great amount of waste within the military. And I saw that not only firsthand at the tip of the spear down range uh, when we were throwing, you know, $50 of plate away for KBR and, and you know, contractors like Halberton and, and things like that. But also my last four years working with Senator Braun, uh, where I covered not just the military itself, but the defense industry. Uh, so I, I think there, there, there were a lot of important points and happy to dive into those a little bit more. The, the other thing that I would say is that I, I do not believe that we need to be the world police. Uh, and I will say that over and over again, we should not have gone to Iraq. And e even if you thought, it, you know, the justification was there, the whole war was handled very poorly. Um, and it, it causes a lot of suffering. Uh, that being said, we also can't be isolationist. We need to look at each individual conflict around the world and see how, how it fits in America's interest if she if we should get involved. Uh, you, you can't be all or none. These are very complex topics, uh, and, and that's how we should look at them. We should look at them individually. We shouldn't be lumping Israel with Ukraine uh, and saying they're the same thing or saying drawing conclusions between them and our support for Iraq and Afghanistan because they're very different. Uh, so... You know, that was a little long winded, but that gives you a little bit more detail about uh, some of the things that he said and, and my thoughts on the topic. Yeah. Well, are, wait, are people trying to compare those? Like, Iran well, I think and Iraq? they're trying to lump them into a they funding just lump package. them all together. So, Tiffany, as someone who served, uh, you know, what did, first of all, what did you think about Mark's comments? And then also, uh, if you'd like to, you know, 
ask a question of John because I've not been in the military. I signed up in 80 because Reagan made me do it, you know, for the draft, but then we never went to fight the Ruskies or anything. So I didn't get to do it. I didn't get to play army like Red you guys Dawn. did. Yeah. yeah, you know, all that stuff. I'm... Wolverines. Wolverines. So, uh, John, thank you for your almost service. And <laughs> other John, thank you for your service. Yeah, too. No, we were to, Tiffany, we're going to refer to him as Lazy John because if you don't have an H in your name, you're too lazy right. to even put an H in your name. So Lazy John and and Diligent John. That's why. And we're Diligent be... John. Yeah. John, thank you for your service. I think that's admirable that you spent some time. And, and, you know, whatever the, the question I always ask people who um, are um, running for positions and they want to go on to D.C. is how do you anticipate um, coming in and having impact um, as a as a freshman um, member of Congress? I know you said that you would request to go on some committees, but if that doesn't happen, how are you going to have impact? Sure. And, and the biggest thing is being able to lead. And, you know, you, you served in the military, thank you as, as well. Uh, but what's leadership? It's motivating and inspiring people towards a common goal. And you can do that with good ideas and by building connections and building coalitions uh, and not just on the Republican side, on, on the Democrat side as well. Uh, and I have experience doing that for Senator Braun and for Senator Coates and, and working with different offices where we might not always see eye to eye on things, but being able to build those coalitions and get things passed and, and not just pass one house, but signed into law. Uh, three of the bills that I authored for Senator Braun were signed into law. And two of those were signed in at times when we didn't have a majority or the presidency because they were bipartisan and we were able to find the common ground. So, you know, you, you start there, you start with something little and, and you, you keep moving until you get to the place that you want to be. I love it. For the folks in the cheap seats, can you let us know which, um, which bills you authored that became law? Sure, absolutely. So there's the Higher Veteran Health Heroes Bill, which was to help uh, transitioning doctors and nurses, uh, corpsmen, th things like that, uh, if they wanted to come and work for the VA so they didn't have to deal with usajobs.gov and, and the, the nightmare that is that process. And it, it streamlined the hiring authority for them. And, and that one is, is it's a conservative bill because you're getting a, a double return on investment for somebody that we likely paid for their training, but also they know the demographic of people that they're working with. They know veterans because they're veterans themselves. Uh, so it's just common sense. Um, the next one was the, a, a bill to improve the spina bifida program uh, in the VA that serves the, ch the children that were born with uh, the birth defect spina bifida uh, due to their parents' Agent Orange exposure in Vietnam. Uh, it was a program that we actually had a, a constituent in Indiana reached out, and I went and visited at his house and, and met his daughter. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these kids, they can only... Uh, work at maybe, maybe a third or fourth grade level. They really can't take care of themselves. Um, and he was worried that, you know, when he passes away, who, who was going to take care of her? And, and the law wasn't specific. Um, and so we went in and we, we made some changes to the language. We also did some OIG reports to get uh, recommendations for what changes to make. And, and during that time, they found $20 million worth of fraud. Uh, so we, we, we worked to take some of the recommendations the OIG reports had and some of the recommendations we got from groups like the Vietnam Veterans of America and from the constituent and came came up with a solution. And honestly, we, we were hoping not to have to write a law because a lot of times that that's the highlight, right? Is, you know, what did you get passed or what did you vote on? But a lot of the job is, is just oversight and pushing people, again, leadership, pushing people to, to do what's best for the country, uh, even if it's just picking up the phone and making a phone call. Unfortunately, the VA promised they were going to institute these changes, and they didn't for two years. And so we ended up working with the committee and codifying it into law. So now that they have to do it, there's teeth behind the, the regulations. Um, and then the, the final bill, so I, I mentioned the spina bifida and I mentioned higher health heroes. The final one was the DROP Act. Uh, so the DROP Act was to help tackle uh, opioids within our veteran population. And it mandated that the VA put an opioid amnesty box 
at all of their hospitals. They had already done some pilot studies and uh, came back with results bringing in thousands of pounds of unwanted drugs. So, you know, grandpa doesn't have to worry about little Johnny getting into his cabinet or experimenting or something like that. Um, and then later on, uh, one of the co-sponsors on that, Senator Kennedy, actually introduced the Dump Act the next year, which allowed the public to come in and use those as well uh, to get those out of out of the medicine cabinet and off the street. Okay, so is that the Kennedy from Mississippi? Is that his name, John Kennedy? Is it? Is it's John it? Kennedy. He's got an H in his name, doesn't he? I, did, I just wanted to put that. You're not going to let it go, are you? No, I'm not going to let it. That's I'll bring it up again if you name another John. But, uh, but yeah, at, if you met John Kennedy, you actually talked to him because he seems like a hoot. I mean, he just, he seems like a hoot, not to get off on that, but that would be fun to go to the Congress, just work with that guy. I mean, he just, he just got that old Southern talk, you no, know, just he, plain no, and simple. He, he asked questions that are dumb on purpose. I know, to just to make reactions it dumber. Out. <laughs> yeah, he fun. asked like he he was talking to a lady from China. She she came over in like 1989 or something like that. And he had, he's like, "Should I call you comrade?" And I'm like, <laughs> "What the hell's the matter with you, man?" Like, <laughs> say it. Should I call you comrade? You yeah, got to do the yeah. accent better. Come on, if you're gonna uh, do no. John Kennedy, good. But uh, well, you know that was Tiananmen Square type stuff. Well, we, that was back in the day. That was yeah, that was all but, that stuff. Yeah, but she I was know. like five. Uh, yeah, at I the know. time, it's like. Oh well, wait, no. um, John, I had questions though. Uh, all right, so uh, your platform kind of sounds like. How do you feel people will respond to like defunding the military? I, I don't think that the military needs to be defunded. I think that we need to cut the waste within the military, and and I'll give you a couple of examples. I, big, well, big, but big by ends. funding it though. Yeah, but by yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's all it's all part of tackling the debt. Uh, the the key difference is a lot of the proposals out there, especially we see nearly every year, uh, Bernie Sanders introduces a bill to cut the military budget by ten percent. Uh, and and we, you know, the military is important. Defense is one of the few things the federal government is supposed to do versus all the things that they get involved in that they have no authority to. And so it's important that we handle something like defense with care. And also because it's our our sons and daughters' lives that are on the line if they are called to go to war. So it's important that we make sure that we don't make these cuts with a hatchet. They're made with a scalpel. So we ensure that, the, that we're still mission capable and that we're still taking care of our troops and their families. Uh, so one example is Tyndall Air Force Base and just bases on the coast in general, uh, it cost up to three times as much to house a service member and their family at a base on the coast in some place like Florida or California, as it does in the Midwest. Uh, we need to start moving missions back to the Midwest. That would be a huge savings. But on top of that, Tyndall Air Force Base, because and whatever your beliefs on climate change are, everybody knows Florida gets hurricanes. This, this isn't rocket science here. And Tyndall Air Force Base has been rebuilt three times over the last 15 years, with the last time costing taxpayers $5 billion. Another bigger example is the littoral combat ship from the Navy. Uh, this is a program that the Navy has clearly said they do not want anymore. It does not fit with the mission. It's not living up to expectations. And it's a hundred billion dollar program. In fact, they've already started retiring the first littoral combat ships after only about a decade. And not only are we still funding the production of these, we're also funding R&D on a system that the Navy doesn't even want. So that would be a, a perfect place to cut money. And it's going to be hard. Don't get me wrong, because the states with shipyards don't like that. They're going to get money from from the lobbyists within the defense industry, but if you if you bring the facts to the table, it's hard for them to fight against it with a straight face. Um, and I'll give you uh, just the smallest one of the smallest examples I can. So here in Indiana, down down south of you guys, we have Crane Naval Base. Oh yeah, you know you, you know Crane Naval Base spends uh, almost one and a half million dollars on mowing each year. Um, and 
there, there's no reason they, they have to have grass to to uh, keep the soil on their bunkers from eroding. Um, but it, it doesn't have to be grass. Why, why don't we get Purdue or one of these other ag universities to do a study and find a crop cover where we're not spending over a million dollars a year just to mow a base? Um, Wait, are there you know, soldiers it's not at a that training base? area? So are there that's where they have munitions. That's where they have munitions, a lot of munitions down there, yeah. Brad. Actually, me well, and my I friend. Mean, can't they mow the lawn? Well, I they do mow the lawn, but they still got to pay them to do it. Yeah. What, you know, what do you how think? They got a lemonade again? stand, too? Money? Over, <laughs> over a million dollars a year. Yeah, so. Okay. Well, you know, one of the things, you know, I'm torn on this. You know, I, you know, Mark Small talks about we need to cut the budget, cut the budget. But if you don't have a strong defense, you know, you – that's how everybody loses in the history of the world. When their defense goes down, they go down. Uh, I mean, think about it. Uh, who were the big three back in the day? France, Spain, and England. Why were they the biggest three then? Because they were the, they had ships and they all had a flag. They said, I'm conquering your country with this flag. And they planted it. Uh, mm -hmm. But now, look, they're not even really any players at all uh with things except for like you know russia invading ukraine but that is not england france and spain it's russia so I'm and it how many Romans, Brad, how many romans do you know i mean italians all italians now but you don't know yeah. any romans no, so how that work out like for them? germany it's supposed like to be the greatest civilization Germany's ever or yeah or whatever so yeah the the German. By the way, my Schmidt's name is Austrian. It's not German. So, I mean, Ken's got a German wife there. She probably, her name's probably Jenny with one N. I don't know how that works. But um, <laughs> John, or uh, is it Lazy? It can't be Lazy John. No, don't say that. He's, um, he's uh, Lazy Word. Look it, John. Yeah, this guy is John. John of the third. John of the third. Uh, what percent of the military budget is geared like right now towards like uh, veterans assistance? Because I think that's something that. Both both parties can get behind. Isn't that a different pocket of money? It, it, it is. So personally, I believe Why? that or how the military, I'm sorry, and I don't know enough about it. So yeah, yeah. Personally, I think the, the military active duty military. Um the, the military veterans affairs and the state department should be considered together because it, it's it's a, a continuous stream. A failure of diplomacy leads to war which leads to creation of they're all, they're all they connected all players. Interconnected. Yes. Yeah. But they're separate. <laughs> and, and, and they're separate because the, the Pentagon and the department of veterans affairs and the state department, they learned a long time ago that they can play off of each other and grow their budgets faster if they if separate. separate them out and then they can each make their own argument, uh, irrespective of how it ties in to that that whole process okay, that does not you. sound patriotic at all and you can quote me on that <laughs> but if the veterans were still under the military the department of defense and we're fighting for you're fighting for health care for veterans versus tanks and planes and guns then service and care for your veterans is going to be in fourth or fifth place so i just feel I, like I the amount of tanks that, should I, I think that they're completely different. It's kind of, it's, if it's, in, it's even with Medicare. You have parts A, B, and C, and D. I mean, you know, different priorities for different people. You just can't lump it all money. together, in my humble opinion. In my humble no, opinion. no, and I just mean like the human part, though, it's like if there's money there that can help a person or money there that can, you know, help buy a tank, like, especially for a veteran and like, so what, every like, veteran gets a tank? Everybody, like, yeah, a, a tank in every box. No, because no, no, everybody would Can sign I grow up. Ivy yeah. on it? Oh, that'd be so cool if we just handed out tanks. Um, <laughs> no, I just mean like the, the care that a veteran would get from uh, like the hospital, like health care, medic like medical care after their service is done. I don't know why that isn't taken into a, like account along with how much a tank costs. Like all of those are should be well, taken. Yeah, what from I, the same and I think pool. you know. Also, Brad, you know, we need to make a terrible, you know, consideration to go into these wars. It's like John. John went to a war where his noble cause, uh, the bad guys, were bombed our buildings and all that. But you look at the veterans that came out of that with the PTSD, PTSD, and you know the different thing. You know, there is that care after the fact. There's, there's not just that immediate 
thing there. So I got a question for you, John. How fast of a reader are you? I mean, can you read pretty fast? I mean, like 2,400 pages a minute? Is that how? Uh, <laughs> no, there are definitely some <laughs> omnibuses that I uh, I had trouble getting through when I when I was reviewing them for Cinder Coats and Cinder Brawn. Uh, but uh, I, I'm I read at a pretty good pace. When you got to do a five thousand or five thousand page NDAA each year, you, you get pretty adept at skimming. Skimming. I'm I. You know what, John? I'm very. Even though you don't have an H in your name, I am very impressed with your with your experience. You really caught me off guard with actually working for two senators, and you know what you're getting into. I see it. You know, and and I'm not going to disparage anybody running for the U.S. House of Representatives, but it seems like it's pretty easy to throw your name in the hat. I mean, if you're going for governor, you got to get a bunch of signatures, senator, a bunch of signatures. Uh, but it, it does seem very easy. And I think that a lot of folks think that, oh, I'd want to go to Washington. I, you know, I don't think they know what they're getting into. Is that a fair statement, John? A hundred percent. I was going for 110, but that's okay. You can just sort of agree <laughs> with me. Uh but, but so that's, that's, so I guess I did have a question there, Lucy, uh, that <laughs> well, how, do you, how do you, how do you think you're going to make a, a difference with all these, you know, 435 people and a hundred crazy senators that are pretty much deadlocked on everything? I mean, I, to me, if, I, you know, if you were in the House of Representatives the last two years, it, other than the Republicans trying to, you know, uh, tar and feather the speaker, there wasn't a lot of excitement. I mean, you know, it gets, things died in the House and died in the Senate, and which a lot of people like that when there's nothing going on. Exactly. They were pretty useless. They yeah, were the most useless yeah. Congress. So how do you get? How do you? How do you get them? I mean, is, is John Kenworthy going to be standing out there on the top of the Capitol dome, uh, acting like Superman to get the attention? How do you? How do you get somebody to listen? No, I'm I'm not, and and the reason why is is that's not me. I'm about finding solutions. And, uh, you know, the, the folks that, unfortunately, the folks oftentimes that are focused more on getting the news on the news uh, than governing is, is a problem. And so that, that's not what I would aspire to do. You know, we, we look for what's, what's the best case scenario, and then we whittle it down to there till we can get a passable scenario. And, and while I know Brad would probably disagree with me on a lot of things, you know, hopefully a passable scenario that pushes things to the right in my case. Um, yeah. And and so that's 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 how I would work. You know, you, you start with what's what's ideal and you figure out what's passable. Right. So uh, it's uh, uh, it, it's just a daunting task. Now, you've not run for any office previously, right? But I, I'm going to give you a pass on this, like it matters that I give you a pass or not, because you have this experience. Now, Tiffany, don't want to shake your head. I'm going to get out of this. Watch me go. Watch me work here. All right, I got so you. you have the experience because you know what you've gotten into with these other senators and Coates. Uh, you know, he he was a he was a military guy. What and was he on the? Yeah, I thought he was. Uh, and then Braun was. You know, you worked with him, so obviously you did a good enough job with Coates that they wanted to keep you on with that. So. Uh, yeah, I think that that would be, uh, so there's another question in here. What would be your number one priority? I know that you talked about your wife being immigration. I mean, you've gone through that system. Uh, what would you, what would you say was the good parts about the immigration thing? And what do you think is just horrid as far as the system goes? Sure. So the, the system is very complex and complicated. Um, and, and it's costly now, you know, that that's that's all has to be in perspective to how much you make, obviously. But at the time that we came through, uh, the cost to get all the paperwork uh, and just the fees associated with it, and get the the doctor's exams and all of that, uh, it came out to about four thousand dollars. And that was for somebody that had been in the military and was comfortable with doing government paperwork. Uh, so I didn't have to hire a lawyer. Unfortunately, we have a a whole system of uh, you know, immigration attorneys that un unfortunately profit off of off of these folks that are trying to do it the right way, and um, and and it's sort of frustrating. There's a lot of things in our government where that tends to happen too. We just had tax day as is another example, but um, you know, for for immigration, we have to look at the whole issue. I hear a lot of a lot of uh, people on the campaign trail that 
only talk about the border, only build the wall, build the wall, build the wall. And I'm sorry, it's that's that's not good enough. Uh, that will not will not fix the problem. We do need to secure the southern border, and I I don't care how it gets done. It's 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 not about it has to be a wall. They can climb over a wall. They can tunnel under a wall. Uh, if you can do it with a wall, fine. If you can do it with with more guards and more surveillance, that's fine too. As as long as the end goal is met. And the reason why the southern border is most important is because that's where we're seeing the majority of the drug smuggling and sex trafficking as well. Um, but that's that's not that's only a portion of this whole immigration debate. Uh, like you said, my wife did come in the legal way. I think that we should make it easier for people that want to do it the right way. And we need to streamline the process and be welcoming them because the people that come here the right way end up being a value to our society. And in many places, we need the workers, but we can't just have everybody coming in in a fashion where they, they bum rush cities that aren't prepared for them and are overwhelmed. That's, that's not a recipe for success. So we need to I, fix I agree problem. with you yeah. about like bum rushing cities that are not prepared. But I think the other part of that is that cities who don't understand the responsibility that they're taking on when they say that they're open, there are these um, sanctuary cities because um, the uh, what the the demand outweighs the supply for what they can give. So I do think it's very much a two way street in that. You know, you've got people asking for services and then you've got cities that say, hey, we're going to service you. And they have no idea how expensive and how long it can take to support people um, who aren't able to legally work in the country. Um, I recently had a debate with my dad. We were talking about the Baltimore Bridge and um, the, the gentleman who were working on that bridge when it collapsed doing the potholes. And um, I was reading about them and it was interesting how they were described as, I think the, the adjective was um, migrants. And then as I read more, they called them um, foreign born. And, um, and, and it's complete tragedy what happened to them because in my mind, I know that whoever got that contract to fill the potholes on the Baltimore bridge, bid it out, and they got the, the cheapest labor that they could find. And they thought, there's no way that this bridge is ever going to collapse. And no one's ever going to know that I have these illegal workers filling potholes on the Baltimore Bridge at one in the morning. Lo and behold, the bridge collapses. And we have these people who have perished. And we're, we're finding out that, um, that they probably weren't even supposed to be there. And one of the questions that I have is what are the legal ramifications for the family? Are the families going to be able to sue and get millions or will the, the families not be entitled to any type of, um, you know, monetary compensation for lose, losing their loved ones and probably the family breadwinners. So there's just this whole bigger thing. And I don't think people understand that when you do have this, um, this, this, this labor force that is not, um, legally represented and doesn't have um, the same um, the same perks, the same rights that we have, they get exploited, they get hurt, and there's no way to compensate them because they don't have a leg, a leg to stand on. So it, it, it you know, it's just, it, I think it's extremely unfair. Well, shouldn't there be somebody to blame then though? Like where does that, but who do you blame? Fault line? I guess. Who do no, you blame? Do you blame? Do you I mean, blame? Do you blame a porous line? border? Do you blame a porous border that allows no, I mean, like people in this to come into our country illegally? Do you blame? Um, do you blame our economic system that says, you know, you know, wh whatever your margin is, however much money you can make to get a job done, that's how you get the job? Or do you say, you know, what's the value of these lives? Are you know American lives worth more than foreign-born lives? I mean. There, there's a lot of bigger questions, but when we have an open border, we allow our system and our economy to exploit people. And that's oh, not yeah. a good thing. That, that's been true for a, a long time. And full disclosure, I have uh, Nicaraguans, Mexicans, all that, all legal. The, the state made sure that they audited me for employment. So, uh, you know, I have, I'm recording, I take the taxes and all that. But I think part of it, Tiffany, is the fact that there is a lot of people that get paid cash. So those guys are probably possibly getting paid cash. So there's no workers comp. There's no anything like that on there. 
But, you know, but but the other side, if you want to be devil's advocate, they don't have rights because they're not they don't have USA rights because they don't they're not USA citizens. So true. But they should not be government contracts either. I the agree. I agree. Somebody needs to enforce this thing. I, I would. Exactly. I, I, you can't take a government me. contract and hire illegal workers and think it's going to be OK. And you just chose to work on the one day that your bridge collapses into the what the Chesapeake Bay. And it's like. Oh, it's like OS. Not only is the bridge gone and your workers are gone, and all of a sudden you're going to be exposed because you had a contract and you hired illegal workers. Yeah, and they're probably the, <laughs> those government contracts or prevailing wage are better usually. Uh, you know, they're union controlled most of them, and you know, a union labor these days is about fifty dollars an hour. So, uh, you and know, so you're that talking- person thought they were going to make some money. They probably subbed it out. And they were like, oh, I got this. I got this. Oh, no yeah, one's yeah. ever going to know. What's the yeah. chances of the bridge collapsing? What's, so what I'm going to ask John, how many uh, how many uh, legal aliens do you have working for you? Or let's see, undocumented citizens, or I don't know how you say the right words, but because yeah, <laughs> they're going to ask. I mean, they're going to ask you that. So everybody that works for me is is legal. And, okay, and yeah. the, the, the list is fairly short. <laughs> <laughs> That's a keep a short list. And that I find that less employees, the less headaches sometimes. But, but, you, but you, know, can... uh, it, you know, one one of the other things, and, you know, you, you brought up a good point with uh, it being a government contract that leads, you know, Davis-Bacon Act, things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there's, there's still even more about this topic. Uh, we keep saying the border, the border, the border, but... 40 to 50 percent of the the people who are here illegally didn't come across the southern border they came in on a passport or they came in legally at first on a, a work visa or a student visa yeah. and they overstayed and and let's be real they are here just as illegally and they skipped the line just as much as somebody that crossed the rio grande and we, we need to be tackling all of these issues um and we need to change the laws now the laws for employers are pretty strict. They just don't enforce them, unfortunately. Right. But the, that hurts the me. Laws, that hurts me because yeah. I'm following the rules, and some people aren't. And uh, but, so. but the the laws for individuals, the the first time offense for crossing illegally, can be as small as a fifty dollars civil penalty. A lot of people think they're automatically going to get deported if they get caught. No, I mean, I've paid parking tickets that are bigger than that. So so when when my party sits there and says, we don't want to do a deal on immigration because none of the laws need to be changed, you, you can tell it's purely party politics. And, and I hate stuff like that. Um, and, and that's not how I'm going to interact. But the, the, the final thing I'll say on this is we need to tackle Mexico. That, that's the lowest hanging of the fruit. We are running a hundred and thirty billion dollar trade deficit with them, while at the same time giving them foreign aid. What kind of sense does that that make? They it's have the government. That's the kind of sense. They, it they, is. They, they've they've had they've had decades to try and help us with this problem, and it just keeps getting worse and worse. And at the same time, they're stealing water from us in the Southwest, from the the Colorado and the Rio Grande. They're not living up to those treaties either. So it, it's time we start using the the stick with Mexico instead of the carrot all the time. Yeah. So uh, how about this? So this is a controversial thing. And I asked the person you're running the seat for. I think I asked Jim Banks this question when he was starting to run for Senate. I said, would you be in favor of. So say you mentioned a, 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 an amount of four thousand dollars as what it cost you. And you were probably like, so say uh, say somebody's been here. And I know people that have been here 20, 30 years. I know a guy that owns a restaurant that's been here over 25 years and you know, they just have been, they stay under the radar. So would you be opposed to them, say, paying a $5,000 fine, which would go to the national debt or building a whatever, board security? Uh, because I, I don't, I don't think they should, I think there should be some kind of punishment, but would you be in favor of some kind of way to uh, make, some, you know, let somebody be, that's been a good citizen for this amount of time, if they pay a fine or a fee, because they broke the law, right? I think everybody agrees that they're breaking the law, and we shouldn't just let them, you know, amnesty like Reagan did in '86. Let three million, three million aliens, you know, illegal aliens, be uh, into the country. How'd that work out? It it just kept, you know, kicked. Well, Bush got elected in '88, though. So yeah, know, well, I mean, and we, we had a low free, national right? debt and low immigration uh, in that era. So, but we don't have any of that now. So something's got to change. So, what would you say, John, about? 
uh, a fine or what would be a solution? I don't have to stay with mine there, but. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it's something that I would be open to discussing and debating. It would depend on the details uh, because there, there is a there's a true logistical problem, right? We're talking about millions and millions of people and, and some of them legitimately don't have a country that we can send them back to even if we wanted. Uh, so it, this is more complex than saying deport everybody. That's, you, you know, I, I think that some people should be deported, but I, I, do, I do think that uh, there, there needs to be some consideration of people that otherwise uh, have, have been uh, following the law and, um, but it's 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 going to be something that it, it would really just depend on on the details and also what's what's achievable. But I will say that the most important thing is, like we saw with Reagan and and other other instances in the past, none of that that shouldn't even be a discussion until the border is first to, first secured, because yeah, you, it's you, like you bailing out a boat with something holes like we, we've heard the promises time and again. We'll we'll just give us this amnesty and 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 we'll secure it later, and it's never worked. Yeah, it's the human first, and then have that discussion. It's like bailing a boat out with the hole bigger than the thing you're spooning it with, and it's like putting cooked spaghetti back in the box. I mean, it just this, this, that this ship has sailed. Um, so you know, and and me in construction, I see it. I mean, every day there's been I've been on jobs where it's me and the superintendent are the only gringos involved in you know on the site. So I don't I don't see. Uh, I just don't see that from hiring than like, you know, native workers, I guess. Uh, I, I, that's a whole nother story. No, had, like, how is that not the story? Well, well because All there's, there's two things and, and I live in Mars Hill. I got my shirt on here, Mars Hill. Uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, but this is sort of a double-edged sword here because the drugs come across the border and a lot of our people, a lot of Americans are hooked on these drugs. Therefore they don't they want to work. Them. They are the market. Yeah, they 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 won't they don't want to go to the job. They can't go to the job. They can't hold the job because down. They they're can't. hooked on drugs that are coming over the border. Right, exactly. And then the people that are bringing the drugs are taking their jobs. So I there saw, you go. I, saw I just a saw really it. funny meme and it was talking about the unemployment rate. And it's like the unemployment rate is so low because people have two and three jobs. Yeah, that's right. That, that is like it. Oh, no, what I mean workers too, I mean like native to like Hoosiers, like people who live in Fisher. Right. Well, and that's, you know, and I'll tell you, I'm going to just sum this up as best as I can. I've been in the masonry business since 1990. And, uh, you know, the, the people that would be what you'd call native Hoosiers, Brad, would come in and they'd be worried about how much money I was making and that they are worth more. And I don't know, you know, I only work three days a week because I can't get by on two days a week. So I've had a couple of Hispanic guys working for me for 20 years, 20 years this year, 20 years. Wow. They've never one time asked me how much money I'm making or been concerned with that. But what they did realize was if I don't make money, I cannot pay them more. So they started with me 20 years ago at $14 an hour. Those guys are making $30 an hour now. Uh, and, you know, wow. they're it's, you know, and they're like my family. So, you know, this is Aww. how you run. A, oh, yeah, I go to the birthday parties and everything. I got, yeah, never mind. But, uh, and they think I'm funny. I don't know why that is. I, mean, I don't think <laughs> it's, it's like, that I know it. so it's like, I don't know if they're just buttering me up or what. That, that, that says it right there. They're laughing at your jokes. They're like, uh, Senor Gringo, laugh, laugh. Senor Gringo, funny. <laughs> I always say, after I say, they only keep me around because I'm tall. And the other thing is when I, like, they can't get something done and I'll go, Gringo power. <laughs> so <laughs> we have, we have a lot of fun doing our work, but they take a lot of pride in what they do. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I, I can't say work. more about the people that I've worked with for these years. Uh, and I've really enjoyed. So Brad, my point is that those guys have, I always tell people two things when you come work for me, attendance and attitude, you got good attendance and you got a good attitude. We're going to be fine. And I'm like Victoria Sparks. Uh, I'll run you off before I fire you. I will make life miserable for you. I'm, I, and when they play that commercial, I go, I like Victoria Sparks. She's she's after a heart. She's after my heart on this one. It's like, why fire somebody when you can run them off? I mean, it's like, you know. Anyway. Well, can I ask John one last question though? Because uh, you worked for uh, for Senator Coates, right? Yes. Um, and then he became like director of national intelligence, I believe. Yes. Uh, under Trump, and so when Trump 
said that he kind of believed Putin over his own uh, intelligence community. Uh, I guess, can you comment on that from somebody who worked for the director at the time? Like, did it wound Senator Co Like, you know, were you like, what is this guy talking about, Senator Co Like, he's... Yeah, I, I'm, it's... I think that Donald Trump has done a lot of questionable things. Um, and, you know, I, I am... I'm the, the one candidate uh, on the Republican side in this race uh, that isn't going to bend over and be his yes man. If he did things right, I think he did great things with the economy. Uh, you know, maybe went a little too far on, on some of the tax cuts, looking at the the deficit now. But, uh, you know, think things were going in the right direction. But there are things that I definitely disagreed with him on, like the bump stock ban. I am a Second Amendment absolutist. I know you, you'd likely disagree with me on that, but I'm not going to sit, sit here uh, and and try and whitewash uh, all of his accomplishments and and all of all of the things that he did one way or the other. Uh, when I go to Washington, I'm not going there to be a yes man. I'm going there to evaluate bills and legislation and actions on the facts and do what I believe is best for the country and best for the district, regardless of whether uh, the leadership likes that position or not. Um, and so uh, I, I would just say, I think it's very telling with that instance with Senator Coates. He, he, I believe he might've been the longest serving, um, longest serving person in his cabinet. Uh, and then once that call, was, he's a man of integrity. Ukraine happened. So he, he was, was, he was gone. And I think it was very telling. I think, I think he had, uh, he had likely run out of, run out of patience. Um, <laughs> and, and I can't blame him at that point. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. yeah, the interesting, interesting times we are in this year with, you know, with the different, you know what our selection. The higher we go up, the less selection we have of, of folks, and it's and it's and it's, honestly, it's about money getting your message out, and it's just so expensive to do that. And I think we've all run for office. And Cassie asked me uh, if my if my workers watch the show. No, they think the Gringo's loco. They say we see enough of him during the day. We don't need to see him at night with his silliness. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah. So, well, I think we, we're pretty much done. I mean, we went an hour, okay. but Tiffany, you got more questions. I mean, this is what's good about this show. We don't have to stop at an hour. We can ask longer. So go ahead, Tiffany. So, John, I have a quick question. John Kenworthy. Uh, who else John. is running for this uh, seat? Who are you running against? Sure. So there are eight candidates, um, obviously myself. And then there's uh, Mike Felker, who you had on previously, uh, Grant Booker, Eric Whalen, Wendy Davis, Andy Zay, Tim Smith, and Marlon Stutzman. Wow, that's a crowded field. So you just need to get, you have a big family, just get your whole family to, you know. I mean, you could win this thing with 35 votes. <laughs> Plurality <laughs> is where it's at. And honestly, I, I probably wouldn't have a chance with without it being that way. And the more people that jumped in, I was happy because I knew that my qualifications and message are the best one. And if I can get it out, I'm going to win. Well, uh, and so that's the goal. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, you're a smart man. Could you call you, you contacted us about being on this show. Now we, I believe we have ruined people's careers before, but in this case, you have shined like a star. You are as well, bright as the eclipse. No, no, that was wrong. Uh, is a shining star. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have one more question, John. So yeah. what, what is your reach been with like uh, door knocking and voter contact and what has fundraising been like? Sure, fundraising has been terrible, um, and part of that's <laughs> Brad, you're not supposed to bust out. Lots of guys. That was the most honest answer I've ever heard. That was really well. Part part of it is because um, you know there's eight people in the race, uh, and part of it is just generally I have a natural aversion to asking people for money in in politics. I think we spend way too much money on politics. Um, I have enough money to to reach the people that I think I need to, to get the vote um, or running some, just started running more digital ads, been doing a lot of Facebook, but now starting on YouTube with pre-run ads and going to be on Rumble and, and Truth and, and hitting in as many places as we can. And But also 
while all those other candidates were out in D.C. or in other states trying to get super PAC money, I was back here knocking on doors and going to parades and going to events that they missed. Now, is everybody going to remember that from last summer? No, but a lot of primary voters do have a pretty long memory, and especially in these smaller counties. Uh, they're very impressed when you show up uh, and, and they notice when somebody doesn't. Uh, so I think that gives me an advantage. I have another question. So you talked about um, reaching out to the people who are important to your campaign, who are going to elect you. Uh, of CD3, I think that's a three, is it CD3? Yeah. Who, uh, who is your targeted voter? So my targeted voter, uh, first and foremost, is going to be veterans, our military, and their families. Uh, because I have so much experience in that space and because we have that, that common shared bond, um, so that, you know, if I can pull a majority of, of that group, that's going to put me a long way on that path to get that, you know, maybe as low as 28% uh, percent, um, that, that's going to be needed here. And I'm, I'm estimating may, maybe that could be less than 40,000 votes. Uh, Jim Banks, when he won the open seat, same deal, gubernatorial and presidential election that year. And he only had six people running against him. And I believe he won with a little over 42,000 or 43,000, something like that. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that would give me a huge start. And then going to, to places where people are receptive of, of my message of being a little bit different and not maybe not being so polished all the time, being somebody that cares deeply about this country and is going to tell you the truth and tell you the facts. Uh, the, the pillars of my campaign are character, integrity, and experience, and integrity is very important. And I know that that's lost me some votes, but if I can't tell the truth and be honest right now, what are people going to expect of me once I get to Washington? I would I much agree. rather much, much rather lose a couple votes now and have somebody at least still respect me. And it's especially important in a district like this, where we do have some strategic voters from the other side. And I will listen to them as well, because ultimately, whoever gets elected has to serve all the constituents, not just their party. Yeah. Well, I I'll love tell you that what, you've been... integrity. That's huge, because, you know, I, I think that when we're campaigning, we're telling people who we are and what we're going to do. And then when we're in, we're, when we're in office, there, there should be no surprises because I told you who I, who I am, what my thoughts are, and hopefully we're aligned and that's why you voted for me. But integrity is one of those things when you no longer have it and people don't trust you, you might as well not even be in office anymore. Cause it's yeah, just, well, you've, you've done very well tonight, John, where can people go to donate? Cause we got to get you some funding here. I mean, a little <laughs> bit more. So you have a website get and, dinner or something. and I'll tell you what, you can also go back uh, in, in the comments and, and put up, put your stuff up there. And I'm going to, Tell my people here that watch the show, uh, hey, let's uh, you know, get in the game here. Here's a guy. He he looks like Hoosiers. He's you know he, but you know there's you got to open up that book to get see what's inside the cover there because this guy's got he's got some good stuff. So got sure. the right it, stuff. Got great the right stuff. stuff. That's right. The the best place is is KenworthyForCongress.com. Um, you know, that's where has the link to, to donate and, and all of that and all my issue areas. But uh, people can also follow me on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Rumble, Truth, YouTube, all, 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 all the socials. I'm, I'm involved uh, in, in one way or the other. So a real Snapchat? grassroots campaign with the grass and the roots. <laughs> Are you on Snapchat? Snapchat. Yes. Uh, or wait, no, not Snapchat, uh, but uh, Instagram. Yes. Snapchat's the, I think, the one that I don't have. I'd probably stay away from that. I don't know much about it, but that's that's I'm not heard good things. That and the TikTok. I'm not on there. I don't want the Chinese people knowing my business. So you know if that's why true. Well, they already know they already know you. I know it. I just try to pretend like I'm a private person now. Whatever. But anyway, so all right, John, we won't make you endure the uh conspiracy theory, uh, unless you really want to, but you've done so well. I hate to see you flush it. No, you, you, you know, when you start out as an intern, uh you get all the phone calls. <laughs> and there's none that I, I I don't think there's any I haven't heard. So, so it's well, it, it, just give us one of the ones that stood out to you. Now, this is not your viewpoint by any means, but so one of your uh, you're on the line, caller. What's on your mind? 
<laughs> Long time sure, so, listener, first time caller. Yeah, the the the, the craziest one uh, was somebody that was complaining about harp up in Alaska, the, the big uh, radio antenna array that's up there. And, um, you know, it had been a long day. And honestly, this guy wasn't even from the state. Uh, and, and I was trying to be nice about it. Uh, and at, at one point, I just said, well, you, you know that they, they use that to control earthquakes in California because they're trying to get people to move away from the coast. And this guy, he, he, he thought he just heard the biggest insider secret in his life. <laughs> <laughs> He's still out there saying it. Yes, yes. He says it caused the eclipse too. <laughs> it, it, yeah, th th then, then after that, I, I shouldn't have done that because afterwards, then he started asking me about chemtrails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the... the, the... He got he he got the inside line to the the insider information. And he didn't want to give it up. He wanted to know did about he, all of them after that. Did he want Area Fifty Seven? What's that one area? What did he want more questions about the area? What's out there in Arizona? That that, that uh, Area Fifty One. Well, yeah, Area Fifty One. I knew it was two twenty one, two fifty one, something like that. <laughs> so, all right, John. Well, we appreciate you coming on, and uh, we wish good you good luck. luck. And hey, folks, give him a couple dollars. You know, come on, the guy he he needs to get his message out there. You know, the mouthwash is doing the best we can with all the people that we can get so we'll uh we'll uh, look forward to seeing the results because it's gonna be interesting come may 7th how some of these races shake out because we don't just have one house seat up we have four of them and it's uh well i guess one of them's contested but the other three are you know hey there's gonna be a new person in there so maybe it might be you and one of it's them cd3 is huge how many counties is that john so it's uh 13 counties but two of them are partial we go clear from Michigan uh, down to Winchester and Randolph County. Damn, Winchester. Yeah, I know that's a lot of that's a lot of area. So, but it looks like he's covering it. So that's a lot of man. Well, we will. Uh, we'll be watching. We'll be watching you. You know, do your thing. So, all right, get your tinfoil hats out, I, John. Don't worry, I'll be the only one to get a tinfoil hat out because you notice neither one of them have an H in their name, so they're lazy too. So, hey, I have an H someplace, don't I? I uh, not to me. Don't I? Yeah. <laughs> my, 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 maiden name is Hill. my maiden no. name is Hill. Come on. What well, you guys got to get in the H's? I mean, okay. it's like it's okay. terrible. So, all right, get your hats on. Thanks, John. We'll, we'll be watching. Congrats. Oh, thank you. Good luck. Yeah. Hey, y'all. It's time for the conspiracy theory. So, you better get your tinfoil hat out and let's see what's going on this week. Okay, let's see. Let's do this way. Are we keeping you up, Tiffany? Is like no. Well, so I left Indianapolis at. Um, I was on the five forty flight this morning, Ooh. and um, three three a.m. <laughs> so I've been up since two. Two. I've been up since two. So That's like, it. yeah. So um, I'm tired. <laughs> what? What are you laughing at? Oh, I think it was a fun Sorry. drive to the airport, though. Like nobody's probably on the road, and you're just flying. You know, you're right, Mike. So, so um, okay, my, I got I got Lucy guy, on here. This guy picked me up in the Uber, and um, and I noticed he was driving kind of slow. He had like this Ford car. It was kind of long. I don't know what it was called. Maybe a Ford Frontier, perhaps. And he he never really got up to sixty miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> But it's all downhill from the north side to the airport. I don't know how he could. No, no, it wasn't. So it was so, just really cute. I'm like, yay, it's well, taking well, forever. I see, John, John, you're backstage still, but stick on because usually I forget to tell the guests to stick around because we usually do a little talk after the show. And that's usually more fun than the show. So anyway, don't 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 bug out just yet. And Liber uh, Lucy, I think I I, I, I see you're uh, yes. unmuted there. So Lucy, Lucy, come Lucy's in. Lucy. Oh, my goodness. Um John, the candidate John has been a delight to listen to. I am so glad to hear the, the term Second Amendment absolutist, uh, because obviously I am as well. I'm waiting for that uh, that tree of liberty to be uh, to be watered with the blood of both patriots and uh, those fighting us. But I got it on the conspiracy theory here. I got to take candidate John to task. Um, you know, he did disclose that he signed a 5000 page NDA. Uh, so all the things that we would want to talk about would be treasonous for him to talk about. I mean, look at what they're doing <laughs> with Edward Snowden. He has to deny. The fact of the matter is, is HARP, the High Altitude Resonance Project, is well known for scalar waves and controlling the weather. It's a Tesla technology. 
Um, in fact, Trump's uncle, remember, he was the one that actually stole all of Tesla's um, paperwork. And his Wait, from MIT? Like the... uh, yeah, Trump's uncle. Yep. The, yeah, the MIT professor that, that gave Trump all of his genetic intellect, right? Uh, well, I, I don't know about that. I don't know if there's any real intellect there. But uh, chemtrails, we have had, we've had geoengineering patents since the 50s and widespread chemtrail or geoengineering use since the 70s. And recently, not that a meme is true, but uh, it, it is true that there was a, a weathercaster. I don't know. I just posted on my wall. I'm babbling. Sorry. There are mainstream people who are talking about the weather modification. I mean, it is, it is a very... Uh, it's out there. MK Ultra, the Manhattan Project, Operation Paperclip, uh, Operation Mockingbird, all of these things are so well known. So candidate John, I understand that you have to deny those things because of that NDA you signed, but I think the real conspiracy is what is he not denying because we don't even know to ask? That's the real <laughs> conspiracy for tonight. Right. Talking in a, I'm talking in a language only known to me. <laughs> so that is... Uh... That's good. So, <laughs> that, I, you know, and you know what, anymore, I don't know what to believe. I mean, you know, everything on the Internet is true. I mean, you know, so, you know, that, that, yeah. that you know, strike that out. But that's it, John, like 4% of the Internet is probably true. <laughs> and I think 2% is that is made up. Well, they say 75% of all statistics. Are well, like we up. believe, like, that's the thing I love is like nobody wants to believe statistics, but everybody wants to believe a poll. Look, Tiffany's, it be a, Tiffany's like, on hee haw now. She decided that <laughs> hey, we're done with this show. Let's go to hee haw. Hey, population Orlando population four uh, four million two hundred twenty seven. Yeah, that that thing's not cooperating. So, uh, uh, so Tiffany, so is that is that a is that a lure to bring a book Bigfoot in that hat? Is like they think no, they're it's a, to keep the sun off of me. Is it sunny now? Like an SPF fifty kind of girl. She's no, like, I'm like an SPF seven. I like to do like a banana boat kind of lotion, <laughs> lay in the sun. But the hat has SPF in it so that I don't get the rays on my head. So sorry, since what? I didn't like, have any foil, it just seemed appropriate. Yeah, that that'll work. That'll work. I mean, you put a white socks hat on, that's gonna do absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll get you another loss. Is yeah, get. yeah they're, how are they doing so far? Are they out of the playoffs? They yet? have the worst record in baseball. I get to go to the game. Well, I'm going to the game tomorrow, though. So, oh, really? Good. Uh, yeah, yeah, that'll be fun. It'll be, it's well, it's we got a little rain coming in. So, take your umbrella. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think the rain's going to be out of the way. I, they canceled tonight's game. So, hopefully, they're going to try uh, to do a double header tomorrow. Where are they sweet. playing? Oh, they're playing up in Chicago. Chicago. You know, Where Brad, it's like a three hour drive. So I, I'm the only person who's gonna be left in Indiana. You guys just left me here. Lucy might might be still there. You wanna to come to the game? I got an extra ticket, man. I don't know. Yeah. Let me see. What time are you leaving? We, we could do like a Ferris Bueller kind of thing and just yeah, too bad go see either. like go see the right stadium. Well, not the right stadium because our stadium yeah, sucks. Just too. go, John. Take off. Is it yeah, supposed I to go. be tomorrow? I, I probably could. I usually have stuff sorted out by Wednesday, <laughs> but but this week was fun. So I had OSHA on the job too. So last Monday they stole my mixer over the weekend. And this week oh, we no. had OSHA on the job on Monday. So I don't want to go in on next Monday. So, yeah. but everything's good. I got a new mixer. OSHA's were good with them. It's all good. So just life in the Oh, John, I saw your fireplace on Facebook. It was really nice. I got it done. It looked fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. If it you guys are, like if you guys are around uh, Saturday night at seven, come on over. Oh, we're still on the air. <laughs> That's it just for these, like... two, <laughs> these two guys. Okay. I mean, well, you can come over. I mean, it's seven o'clock. Well like, it looks like a, uh, looks like, like a, a looks like, looks like a guy that's been laying bricks for 45 years. Did it right. Done. It's like a freaking fire fortress. Oh, it is. Uh, it's in, you know, it's, it's, uh, a lot of that's, that's leftover stone. If you drive up, uh, 37 in Fishers where the, uh, uh, childcare, the, what's the place called the childcare up there by Verizon, that's the oh, same yeah. stone. I had that leftover. So, yeah. Wait, all. So do the people in the chat think that we, the banner's not up? No, they got it now. Oh, okay. it, it's just slow. Yeah. They, they you're have right. to remind you're me because I'm a, uh, I am a little slow. Thank you, John. <laughs> the slow um, down. Well, wait, can I can I go? Because like my uh, yeah. my conspiracy theory is kind of a question for all of you because I don't know what this this word is. 
It's like an er like I feel like I'm old and need to look it up in Urban Dictionary kind of kind of age. There we go, making fun but of the old people. It, well, yeah, no, I feel, but it's it's partisan because I was watching uh, Mike Braun. It was like an anti Mike Braun ad, and they said that he is nothing but a BLM loving rhino squish. And I oh, have no squish. idea what the hell a squish means. That squish is not really old. It, it is sort of a squish is just like soft and, you know, squishy type of thing. That's what I think it is. What Why do you would think they call him a squish? Like, it, it, I don't know. Like, I mean, they call him anything. The name that they came up with was squish? Hmm. Not wow. I don't know. What do you think, Tiffany? I've what watched this commercial like five times too. So just I don't know. Like, who has an Alexa? Be like, Alexa, what's a squish? <laughs> yeah, maybe somebody in the audience can help us. If they, yeah, you know, Alexa, actually, you we've know. increased viewership on the conspiracy theory part of the program, so we better get. Well, and then um, my my prediction: uh, Fish is playing a, uh, a sold out four night concert this weekend in Las Vegas uh, at the Sphere. Um, oh yeah, they're the second band to you know, and they they're Me like too. basically just tuned for it. So I got the webcast today. I can't wait for it. I'm going to watch all four nights. Um, but my prediction is that Fishers, Indiana, will actually get their own little mini sphere due to the work of uh, City Council Member Tiffany Ditlifson. And uh, when Fish comes through on their summer tours, they're going to play little shows at the mini sphere in Fishers. Uh, so, so start thank saving, you. saving back thank some money, Thank you to Tiff. Tiffany Ditlifson in advance. Yeah. For yeah, this we, like, we, lovely, yeah, we, lovely. A, a fish in every pot. Is that that's your slogan? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. So that it's so yeah, fishing. Yeah, fishing. Uh, yeah. So love uh, it. Here we go. The witty says uh, they will call it the fish bowl. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. There you go. See, we just solve problems left and right here. Tiffany, you got to make it happen. Yeah, we welcome diversity. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait. Can I at least get a tour of the new stadium when uh, when it's done or something? Because like that place. I love stadiums. I go to yeah. cities for that. So that's, yeah. Well, they they use that, that for uh, uh, what kind? They're using it for practice stadiums? No, Indy Fuel. Uh, they're moving there. Oh, the fuel. Oh, yeah. that's good. Yeah, wait. We, so, I just went to yeah. another game where it was like one of the last games at the uh, Farmer's Field House or whatever. So. so here you go, John. John's busy in the chat there. So there you go. Ken Worthy for Congress. Man, if his name was Trustworthy. That'd be perfect, wouldn't it? John Trustworthy. I mean, that's a guy you could trust. For Congress with two Zs. So um, <laughs> our, <laughs> so our event center will open, uh, I think it's Thanksgiving weekend, and we'll be the home to the Indy Fuel, the Indy Ignite, which is a female, female, it's a female professional volleyball team. And then also we'll have an arena football team. So a lot of good stuff here in Fishers. Oh, so. are they going to be those? I've That's seen awesome. those one gals that play the football in their bikinis. Is it going to be that? Uh, no, no bikini football. And those, so those, those, those chicks are brutal on there. They smash, they play smash mouth football. How do they not get That's all That's more of a up? Mars Hill type of event. Oh no, that you don't even want to know about that. <laughs> that that is way no no no. Like uh, that's like pro volleyball. These are like girls that could like like. Have you ever seen Scott Sterling uh, volleyball videos of him? Yeah, I used to. Hit? I used to play. We used to play two man, three man volleyball. And I, you know, if anybody that plays volleyball, I can spike behind the line. That that you know, there's a if you're in the back row, you got to you can't go in front of that line. So I could do that. So that yeah. was you know. So here, here, here's I got an H in my theory. name. So mine is about uh, volleyball and. Um, I, I like men's volleyball. I think it's a wonderful sport. And I think that um, when people really start to care about kids in the inner city, they will bring uh, men's volleyball to inner city schools because it will create a pathway for a lot of really great athletes uh, who don't make their local basketball teams to participate in a sport and to perhaps go to college. And the really great thing about volleyball is that it doesn't take much space. You just need a net. You need one ball played on a basketball court and the opportunity for kids to fight is minimal because you're only crashing into kids on your own team. So I think that men's volleyball in inner cities will change, uh, change the United States. 
All right. Well, that's uh, I think pickleball. I think pickleball is going to drift down to the lower ages, and then that'll be this. That'll be the same sort of thing. Yeah. Well, you know, once it gets to uh, a certain community, we'll take it over. So we want y'all to have. I already, it, I already know. <laughs> well, you know, I always I find it hard. How do you those pickles? They can't be bouncing like right. A pickle's going to bounce like a football. It's not really going to bounce like a tennis ball. Isn't how do you like how do you hit a pickle? You got to use a played. spear. John, oh. you can't use a whole one. You got to use a spear. He said use toothpicks. That would be there really go, the yeah. best way to do it. Okay. They say I don't once, know you if start, I... once you start, you never come back. So be careful. <laughs> yeah, you just, you just, once you go is... pickleball, you never come back. So <laughs> That's right. You get. I don't want to get in a pickle. You know, what do you call a pickle? That's What do you call a pickle before it's a pickle? Is it a cucumber? Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I call it a pickle. So anyway, uh, let's see. I don't have a conspiracy, I don't think. I was wishing we had an eclipse or something I could talk about. Can you talk about outlawing all pickles but dill pickles? Ooh. Whatever. Because like anyway. bread and butter pickles are just gross. So who yeah. was on the show last week? Who would you have on last week? Uh, we had Curtis Hill. How was yeah. it? It was good. Well, he was driving, and, and it was, you know, that was a little – on, on the stuff, but he made time for us. But it, I thought it was a good show. We got to, Brad got to ask a few questions oh, <laughs> and whatnot. Yeah, Brad. So next week will be fun, though. We have uh, Burning the Bridges of Madison, fourth installment of Brad's Madison yeah. County up there. So we'll I know have, I need to actually like pay attention this time, I think. Yeah, because those are people but, you can but, vote but you for. You said Becky Cash is coming on, right? When's well, that's going to be the 14th of May. So she's going to come really? on and talk about her stuff. So we, you're like hey. licking your tops up there, Brad. What's up? Nothing. 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 Okay, not, not I think it'll just be a fun time. Is all. Long. Yeah, I like Becky Cash. She's you know what I say. The people that are approachable, I like those people. They get on. She gives she honest answers. So does. John, John <laughs> sought us out. John saw that you know uh, uh, Kelker was Kelker was on, and he said, "Hey, I want to do this too." And I I was very impressed with our guest tonight. How about you, Tiffany? Yeah. Oh, I thought Brad? it was very interesting, very knowledgeable, very experienced. Yeah, I was surprised with the experience level. I really, you know, you don't want to, you know, we jump to conclusions on what somebody looks like or this or that. I mean, I've already let my mind run wild. It'll get all out of control. Listen, we don't want to trust the experts, though, right? Like, no we experts. Just, we can't just be trusting experts willy nilly here. Can I? Yeah. Can I offer a dissenting opinion here? I mean, I think candidate Jim is awesome because of his Second <laughs> Amendment stance. But the fact of the matter is, is he's been in longer right now than some of the other politicians. And so that makes me suspect him. I think that everybody should be one term <laughs> and done, one and done, because it gives you less time to amass wealth and power. So what's he been transparent doing with that? So, well, I don't think you're going to be able to blame John for that, that type of thing. I mean, it looks like he's going to do it for a while and Wag run for president because he'll fix it all. Wag the dog. I would fix it all. But you guys wouldn't like my solutions. <laughs> well, we'd be all canning our own food, canning our own food and living in the bunker, uh, and then the Fed would be ended. Uh, well, you wouldn't I, be able to bomb people, and you know, you wouldn't be able to bomb brown people all over the world anymore. And Northrop Grumman really likes making that money, as does yeah, the guys from the other defense industries. Hey, Lucy, I heard Tony Katz the other day say taxation is theft on the <gasps> tax day. And by the See, way, he's coming around. He's you coming know what around. I wrote on my checks that I wrote yesterday. to the. I wrote to the IRS, Lucy, in your honor, I put taxation is theft in the memo. Do you think I'll get audited? Um, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I should have taken a picture of it, but it was. <laughs> John, no, as really much as the government comes for you, that's pretty bold. I thought that was ironic that on Monday I wrote them a big check for the state of Indiana and then OSHA comes and tries to get more from me. Now, if they think about it, if they find me or whatever, that's less income I make. That's less taxes they get. So I don't know why they want to do such a thing. But anyway, no fines were done. We were good. So, but I just thought it was fun. Monday was fun, fun day. It's like IRS. And now I got my property taxes. They raised my, my house is mysteriously worth $15,000 more just because the sun came up and down a couple of times. So, so. I think I they think knew you were working on the fireplace. There's they didn't see the bricks. fireplace yet. Wait till next year when they see the fireplace. It'll be 30000 more or something. Reclaimed bricks. Yeah, that's yeah. like. A stick on stone. We call them licking sticks. That's where you put a little like tile and then you baker's bag of it. Yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. it was a lot of work. I did the cap during the eclipse. So on the eclipse, I put up their eclipse and the date in my name. And then Lisa was upstairs. I wasn't going to do it. Lisa's sewing rooms 
up there on the second floor and she kept texting me. Uh, I can see your butt crack. I'm like, what woman? <laughs> leave me alone. Leave. I'm out here doing man's work. You can stay up there and sew. I told her, I said, you know why you got short feet? So you can stand closer to the sink. <laughs> oh, don't send the hate mail to me. I, I heard that from somebody else. Tiffany, what? I can't I wait to that use that at work. Great division of labor. I love that. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm getting in trouble here. All right. I don't have a conspiracy theory. Lucy had a, had a good one about not having a, having a conspiracy theory, but not knowing what the conspiracy is because we have an NDA in place. Maybe that's my excuse. John, can I tell you what I'm going to try to do at the game tomorrow? Uh, because run gonna, on the field gonna, nude? Are you going to run on the field nude? I was I was thinking about either streaking, at least painting my chest, but what I actually landed on was the White Sox have like really, really just horrible attendance, but it's not our fault. Like tickets are expensive and we're fans that like, yeah, we're not going to, we're not Cubs fans. We don't just go cheer for whatever. Like you, you have to kind of be playing good. Well, anyways, um, when I go there, I want to see if there's enough people to actually do a whole thing of the wave, oh, the wave all the way around the stadium. But because, like, say we all sit in one row around the stadium. I oh, don't just one row? Enough, just one row. I really don't think there's going to be enough people to do it. Like, yeah, I think that's uh, how few people are going to be at the game tomorrow. That's that's my Conspiracy I, you know, it, it's just like what that Tiffany said, the unemployment's down so much because everybody's got three jobs. So you think it's just people can't take off the time. It's too expensive. It's, you know, America's well, You're time. taking off time from work when you need to be earning money to go spend a crap ton of money at a place that has like $30 parking, you know, $8 hot dogs. I love it. It's, $8 it's insane. It's it just, tastes extra good. Oh, my God. At this so at Disney, at this hotel, they had a $12 hot dog today for lunch. How was it? No. No. It was worth $3. Was worth $3. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not paying that much for a hot dog. Are you crazy? Yeah. It's like, no, so are you going to go to the Mickey like Mouse land? Are you going to the Mickey thing. Mouse? Are you going to go talk to Mickey Mouse tomorrow? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, I'm flying back tomorrow night when we're done. So all I'll right, be right. home in my bed tomorrow night. I'm so excited. Well, we appreciate you staying up since almost 24 hours to be on the show. And, you know, you've done. And I need well. a ride home from the airport. <laughs> oh, get it. what time are you coming in? I, I don't have to go north. Oh, my God. The comments are going to go nuts now, Tiffany. Somebody don't inbox me. <laughs> let's see. Yeah, let's see. Nope. All right. All right. Well, let's see. That's it. Let's put the thing on here and uh, we'll talk to our guests backstage and then call it a day. So uh, here's the ending. So say bye or forever hold your peace. Bye. See you next week. Same bad time. Same bad change. Bye. Yeah.